said, don't be freaked out by the camera. It's a little bit weird, but we're just doing this so that we can maybe make some DVDs and send it to different groups and stuff like that. So tonight, like I said, we're talking about the author of our emptiness. And we're going to be in Ecclesiastes for a little while, which if you've read Ecclesiastes, it can get to be a little bit of a downer sometimes, but don't worry, there's hope at the end of this. So tonight we're talking about meaninglessness, and I wanted to tell y'all this subject about coming from empty to full has been on my heart for many years, and um, it was actually one of the first devotionals that I ever wrote was about this sub subject. I wrote it as a senior in high school, and it was about finding our true life in Christ. So this is something that has really driven all that I do is that we have true life, we have real life in Christ, but so many of us are kind of missing that. So the author of our emptiness, and as we dig into Ecclesiastes, I was reading about the purpose of the book of Ecclesiastes, and this is what I read. It said, to spare future generations the bitterness of learning through their own experience that life is meaningless apart from God. Solomon lived it and said, hey, this is meaningless for us so that we don't have to go through that and so that we can realize, hey, apart from God, life is meaningless, but with him, we find all meaning, we find all fulfillment, we find true life. So let's dig in to Ecclesiastes 1, and we're going to be going through chapters 1 through 6. Really quick, don't worry, you're like, how long are we going to be here if we're going 1 through 6? But we're just picking a few verses from each. So first, Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 4. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 4 if you have your Bibles. And it says, I'm using a different translation, so if you're thinking, where is she reading, that's why. But these are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work? Generations come and generations go, but nothing really changes. Solomon hits us right off the bat. Everything is meaningless. Let's keep going to verses 13 and 14 in that first chapter. It says, I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done in the world. I soon discovered that God had dealt a tragic existence to the human race. Everything under the sun is meaningless, like chasing the wind. All right, so wisdom is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 2, verse 1. I said to myself, come now, let's give pleasure a try. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. So pleasures as well are meaningless. Ecclesiastes 2, 17. So now I hate life. Because everything done here under the sun is so irrational. Everything is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Work is meaningless. Toil is meaningless. We'll see that um, in Ecclesiastes 3.11. We get a little glimpse of hope, okay? Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. Even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So we see in this verse that God has planted this sense of eternity within our hearts. He's planted a spiritual thirst within us to seek after him. Let's keep going. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 14 through 16. Ecclesiastes 4, 14 through 16, it says... Such a youth could come from prison and succeed. He might even become king, though he was born in poverty. Everyone is eager to help such a youth, even help him take the throne. He might become the leader of millions and be very popular, but then the next generation grows up and rejects him. So again, it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. And in that verse, we see that power and advancement, that is meaningless as well. Just a couple more verses about the meaningless life. Ecclesiastes 5.10 Those who love money will never have enough. How absurd to think that wealth brings true happiness. It is meaningless. Another translation says whoever loves money never has enough money. 
Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This, too, is meaningless. So money is meaningless as well. Riches are meaningless. In our last verse in Ecclesiastes, we're going to look at chapter 6, verse 12. It says, In the few days of our empty lives, who knows how our days can best be spent, and who can tell what will happen in the future after we are gone? Solomon calls these lives just empty lives. And he said, what are these days all about? What is this all about? If wisdom and pleasure and work and toil and advancement, power and riches are all meaningless, then what's the point? And I don't know if any of y'all have ever been there and thought, really, what is this all about? Why has God given us, given us this life that feels meaningless and empty at times. And I'm sure right now you're sitting there thinking, wow, thanks Trish, this is so uplifting. Life is meaningless. I'm just, it's meaningless, it's empty, it's worthless. But like I said, there's hope, right? And that hope comes through Christ. But I think we have to start at this emptiness to realize where God can take us and the fullness that he can bring to our lives. So that's why we're starting with the author of our emptiness. And I really want us to be honest with ourselves and to examine our hearts and our souls and ask ourselves the question, have we, have we become callous to this thought of being meaningless and being empty without Christ? Because I think that that's a danger that many of us come to. We become callous and we don't realize our need for Christ. So we can't miss something really important that Solomon has said again and again in these verses. He said, everything under the sun is meaningless. The key phrase here is under the sun. And the reason that that is the key phrase is because he's right. Everything under the sun, everything of this world, everything earthly and temporal is meaningless. It will all fade away. It will be gone. But the thing that matters are those things that are above the sun. So that's kind of where we're going to try to go in this study. We're going to try to get out of this under the sun thinking and go above the sun and think about an eternal perspective on life. Because when we gain that eternal perspective on life, when we have that kingdom focus, then we can gain meaning. We understand why we work. We understand why we do the things we do because we see that they have purpose through Christ. But until we realize that, we will feel a sense of emptiness. We will feel a sense of meaninglessness. So I think many of us as Christians and as believers, we've come from a point of emptiness to fullness because we have Christ. But so many of us are just tapping into a measure of the fulfillment that he can bring. And I don't know if any of y'all can relate to that. Maybe you're just tapping into a little bit of the fullness that God can bring. But he's saying, I just want to fill your life overflowing more than you could ever imagine. And he wants that fulfillment to rush into your life, to just come gushing in. But so many of us are just allowing Christ to come in a little bit. So let's back up a little bit and let's talk about the author of the emptiness. Many people think that I will come and say the author of our emptiness is Satan. It's the enemy. It's the devil. But I don't think that's right. I think that the author of our emptiness is God himself. I think he planted this emptiness within us so that we would seek after him. But so many of us are seeking after the things of this world to fill that emptiness but the author of our emptiness is God himself and it might sound blasphemous it might sound erroneous but that is the truth that God has planted that emptiness within us in his infinite wisdom he knew he had to put that void within us so that we would seek after him he wants us to seek after him and to find him because that's where we will just like I said have that flooding and that gushing of life to the fullest so Let's go back to Ecclesiastes 1 and talk about these verses just a little bit more. So verses 1 through 4 said, Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work? 
Generations come and go, but nothing really changes. Solomon was definitely onto something right here. Life is meaningless. Like I've said, everything under the sun is meaningless apart from Christ. And that's where I don't want you to leave saying, man, what a downer. Everything's meaningless. That key part, apart from Christ, everything is meaningless. But with him, we gain true life and life to the fullest. So this message is not a message of hopelessness, but it's quite the opposite. It's a message of hope that comes through Christ. Hope in Christ. This true hope that's not a wishful kind of hope, but a hope of assurance that with Christ, life becomes full. We kind of hit on this verse already, but Ecclesiastes 3.11 that says he has planted eternity in the human heart. Even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. He planted that thirst, that spiritual thirst within us so that we would seek after him to fill, to fill that and to satisfy us. And nothing, absolutely nothing can quench that thirst within us except for God himself. So I'm sure you've all heard the phrase, the God-shaped hole, and that's your number one blank, the God-shaped hole. This is not something that I've made up, you know, this is something that's been talked about for a long time. And when I was reading about the God-shaped hole, someone said, this is a terrifying bottomless abyss opening up inside of us, which we would do anything to fill. And I'm sure that maybe you've experienced that in your life where you've just been seeking for something to fill that void within you. Or if you haven't necessarily done that, then you've seen those around you. You've seen the world seeking after things, something that will fill them, something that will satisfy, something that will give, that, that's, give them that sense of fulfillment. They've got to fill that terrifying abyss, as it was called. It's the yearning in the human soul. It's that yearning that drives us on our spiritual quest. And uh, the philosopher Pascal said, What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness, all which, um, of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace? This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking the things that are not there, the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. The only thing that can fill that void, I know I'm being repetitive, but I want to drive this home, it is only God himself. He also said there is a God-shaped vacuum, I'm sure you've heard this, in the heart of every man and only God can fill it. And Augustine in his confession said, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. I'm sure if you're honest with yourselves, you felt that sense of discontentment in your life before, unrest, and so many times it's because we're apart from God. But when we come to him and rest in him, let our restless souls rest in him, then we will find that satisfaction. We will find contentment. All right, number two on your little outline is realizing our need. So we have this God-shaped hole within us, but we have to realize our need to fill that. And we have to realize our need only comes and is satisfied through Christ. So some of you might really understand this emptiness that I'm talking about. You said, oh yeah, I've been there. I know what you're talking about. I've felt that deeply. I've felt it often. You might even be feeling that sense of emptiness right now. And then some of you might be saying, Trish, this is such a downer. No, I'm good. I don't have this emptiness. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm fine. I'm good on my own. I've got it together. And if I'm honest, that's probably what I would say if I were sitting right here. Okay, yeah, I'm good. I'm fine. I got it together. But if we truly examine ourselves, we'll realize we really don't have it together. And sometimes that's the biggest trap of all is when we think we do have it all together on our own. 
we think, I'm good, I'm fine, I don't really have that need. But once we realize our need for Him, then He can come and fill us. We have to realize that need. We can't fall into that, that trap of thinking we've got it all together. But when we realize our need for Him, and it's that desperate need, we need to come to Him on a daily basis. This isn't just something where we can say, oh yeah, I've got that need, Lord, please come and fill me. But this has to happen on a daily basis where we come to Him and we are desperate for Him and yearning for Him because we know that we can't do it on our own. We can't live this life on our own. We will be left empty and worn out and broken down if we try to do it on our own. But when we come to Christ and when we realize Okay, I'm giving this all to you, and we're going to have a whole week on surrender and giving our lives over to Him because that's a big part of this process of being filled and coming to fulfillment. But when we realize, okay, I'm giving it over to you because I can't do this on my own, a huge burden is released, and He can come and give us that rest and that contentment that we can't have otherwise. So we have to realize our need. And when that happens, he will pour out his power of fulfillment on us like we've never experienced before. The depth of this filling power, and it is powerful. But like I said earlier, some of us aren't really experiencing the full measure of what Christ has for us. We're just tapping into it a little bit. We're just cracking that door of our heart just a little bit and saying, okay, you can come in in this part of my life, Lord, but this part's pretty good. I've got this part together, right? I don't know if y'all have ever done that, but I've definitely done that. And I've been afraid if I let the Lord in on this part of my life that's really pretty smooth right now, I don't want him to rock the boat. Because following Christ isn't always easy, and living for him radically is not always easy easy but when we say okay Lord I'm giving it up I'm letting you just come in we swing that door of our heart wide open then he can fill us in a way that overwhelming just overflowing satisfaction that he promises us but we have to take the step of letting him in and that goes along with the surrender that I was talking about so I want you to think about have you ever experience this overflowing power in your life this overflowing sense of fulfillment and I want you to know that 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 doesn't have to be just a one-time thing where we have this overflowing sense of fulfillment in life but that can be a daily occurrence as we follow Christ and it should be if every day we wake up and say Lord this is your day my life is yours. He will fill us with that overwhelming, overflowing power of fullness and of life. And I hope that y'all don't think that I'm some prosperity gospel person saying, if you follow Christ, then life's easy. Because following Christ, like I said, is not always easy. It's not always safe. But in the good times and in the bad times, when we follow Christ, he will bring us that sense of contentment and joy and fulfillment in every way so yeah I'm not saying you won't have tragedy I'm not saying you won't have tribulation we will scripture promises us that we will have difficult times for the testing of our faith but in those difficult times Christ is there and Christ can fill us with life to the fullest it's true it sounds crazy but it's true all right number three we're going to talk about the hunger and the thirst within our souls, the hunger and the thirst. I've read this great book by Max Lucado, who I just love. I think he's wonderful. And it's called Come Thirsty. And he talks about the dehydrated heart. And I love that picture of the dehydrated heart. And this is one thing that he says. He said, deprive your soul of spiritual water and your soul will tell you. Dehydrated hearts send desperate messages. Snarling tempers waves of worry, growling beasts of guilt and fear. You think God wants you to live with these? Hopelessness, sleeplessness, loneliness, resentment, irritability, insecurity. These are all warnings. They're symptoms of a dryness deep within. 
Treat your soul as you treat your thirst. Take a gulp, imbibe moisture. Flood your heart with a good swallow of water. And that water is Jesus Christ. We have to flood ourselves daily with the person of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we will have a dehydrated heart. And I know when I was reading that, that hit home for me. You know, hopelessness, sleeplessness, loneliness, resentment, insecurity. These are all symptoms of having a dehydrated heart. And I was thinking, I definitely fall into some of those categories on many days. And so it's kind of a good check of our heart. If we're falling into those categories, if we're worn down, if we're irritable, if we're whatever it might be, we can realize our hearts are dehydrated. We need more of Christ. We're thirsting for him. And he will come and fill us. He will quench that thirst if we let him. Let's turn to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. This is one of my favorite psalms. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. It says, A psalm of David regarding the time when David was in the wilderness of Judah. He says, O God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your glory and power. Your unfailing love is better to me than life itself. How I praise you. I will honor you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest of foods. I will praise you with songs of joy. I love those verses and I love that it starts out saying that David wrote this in the wilderness. And I thought that was a great picture for us because maybe you are in kind of a wilderness of sorts in your life where it's dry or empty, lonely or hollow, or maybe you've been there before. Maybe you might end up there one day, but at some point in our lives, we might end up in the wilderness. And I think that we need to emulate David's heart cry when we end up in the wilderness and say, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. I seek for you. And I, I just want to ask you, and you don't have to answer, but are you truly seeking after God on a daily basis? Are you yearning for him because so many of us especially if we've grown up in the church we can fall into going through the motions and we can feel like we're doing the right thing we might be doing the right thing but we're not yearning for God and seeking after him the way that he has called us to and if we're not yearning for him and seeking after him we won't be fully satisfied in this life so we need to copy what David's doing here and saying, Lord, my soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. I yearn for you. Worship him for who he is. Realize the majesty of our God and realize that only he can satisfy us. Like David says in verse 5, you satisfy me more than the richest of foods. I will praise you, Lord. He satisfies us more than the richest of foods. He's more than enough. Like that song that I played at the beginning, he is more than enough. He's not just enough, but he is more than enough. He's everything. He's all that we need. But for some reason, we kind of settle, right? We don't drink from the water that Christ can bring. We don't go to the bread of life that can satisfy that hunger, but we just settle. We settle for the cheap drink. We settle for the cheap food. He's saying, hey, come to the steakhouse and we're walking into the McDonald's. We're settling for the counterfeit and for the fake. And so many of us do that. And that's what the world does as well. We're seeking to be filled, to be satisfied in things that will not do it. And the Lord's saying, here I am. I'm ready to fill you. So that takes us to point number four, which is settling for the counterfeit. Settling for the counterfeit. As human beings, we are wired to be worshipers, right? 
we are going to worship something in our lives. The question is, what are we going to worship? We're going to do a whole nother week on the battlefield of the heart and talk about those idols in our lives that are keeping us from just giving it all to Christ and to following Him fully. But there are those things in our lives that we worship. Sometimes that can be our family. I know that sounds crazy, but we can worship our family and put that ahead of God. But the question is, what are we going to worship? What are we going to fill ourselves with? What are we pursuing in life? And when we come to realize that we're going to fill ourselves with something, our hearts, our souls, our minds are going to be filled with something, we have to examine ourselves to see what that is. What are we filling ourselves with? 1 Samuel 12, 21 says this, And turn not aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. Are you turning aside to the empty things that cannot profit, that cannot deliver, that just leave you hollow? Are you going to come to Christ who can fill you completely? You're going to hear me say that over and over and over again. But we chase after the empty things of the world. Like Solomon says, it's like chasing the wind. But when we come to Christ, we will be filled and the reason that those things of this world leave us so hollow and leave us empty and with that feeling of meaninglessness is because they're fake. They're counterfeit. They're not the real thing. Scripture says that I have come to bring you true life. Christ has come to bring us true and real life. But we're just settling for the fake and the counterfeit. And what that might look like is just buying into the lies of this world. I want you to think about some of the lies that you have bought into. I wrote a few down. So we think, when I get married, then I'll be satisfied. Then some people might think, no, me, don't worry, Sam. When I get a divorce, then I'll be satisfied. When I have kids, maybe then I'll be satisfied. When the kids are gone, then I'll be satisfied. If I get that job, maybe then I'll be satisfied. If I get out of this job, maybe then I'll be satisfied. And we just go through this cycle of discontentment and never being filled and buying into the lies of this world that maybe that'll fill us, maybe that'll satisfy us, and we're left again and again unsatisfied. And it's because, like I said, we're settling for the counterfeit. We're settling for those empty things instead of coming to Christ who can fill us completely. It's like we're just living in the shadow of the real thing until we come to Christ and give it all to Him. So let's talk a little bit more about the search. And I want you to know that the search within us is not bad. Like I said, God put that within us so that we would seek after Him. So the search is not bad. The thirst and the hunger within us is a good thing. That's why most all of us I would say probably all of us came to Christ in the first place is because we had that thirst. We felt that need within us. We were searching for something and we came to the real thing. We came to Christ. I want to tell you how common this search is. I have a website where I write devotionals, a little blog, and I can see what people search for to get to my blog. And the number one search is how do I fill the emptiness in life? How do I fill the emptiness in life? And the next one is, how do I find meaning and purpose in life? So people are literally searching through Google or Yahoo or Bing or whatever the search engine is to find that meaning in life, to figure out how to fill the emptiness in life. And it's Christ. But it sounds too easy, right? Or it just sounds kind of crazy. But the answer is Christ. Rick Warren, in The Purpose Driven Life, says this. Do you think it's possible that God created us hungry for the very thing He wants to give us? He created us to seek Him. If so, wondering about your purpose could very well be the most important thing you could do. If this is true, then wondering about your purpose is the first step to finding it. So it's good when we feel that emptiness and when we wonder how do I have purpose? How do I find meaning? 
How do I find fulfillment? It drives us to Christ. And we will keep searching. We see the world doing it, just searching, going from thing after thing after thing, thing, and they'll keep searching until they find Christ, which is the true fulfilling factor within our lives. So let's talk about the last point, which is the search for the real and the lasting. The search for the real and the lasting. And this is a little sneak peek into next week, which will be the author of our fullness. And we're going to talk about the meaning and the purpose and the contentment that we find in Christ. But let's turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, 27 through 28. Acts 17, 27 through 28. And it says, His purpose in all of this was that the nations should seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him, though He is not far from any one of us. For in Him we live and move and exist. His purpose, it says it plainly here, was that we would seek, we would search, and that we would find him. His purpose for our lives is not for us just to keep wondering and seeking for what might fill us, but he wants us to find him. And he's standing there with open arms saying, come to me, I'm ready to give you life to the fullness. And in him we find that real life, that true life. And we see in that verse it says, in him we live and move and exist. This isn't a sort of empty kind of existence, but in him we tr find that true life. Let's turn to 1 Peter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter 1, 18. It says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. In a few weeks, we're going to talk about the sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross and the way that he emptied himself so that we might be filled. But in this verse, we see that he paid a ransom for us, that ransom was Christ, and that he saved us from the empty life that we inherited from our ancestors. This life on the earth is empty without Christ, and he brings us that fulfillment. One of our key verses throughout this whole study will be John 10.10. 10, says the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come to give you life and life to the fullest. Life abundant. Life in all its fullness. That is the purpose of Christ coming, was to give us life in all its fullness. Life abundant. This new life. It's a gift of life. And so throughout this study, my challenge, my charge to you is that you will accept the gift of life that he has given us and accept eternal life. And one thing that I think is important for us to realize that eternal life is not just one day something that we will get. Eternal life occurs the moment that we accept Christ. It's the moment of our salvation we have eternal life. And that's not just a quantity of life, but it's a quality of life. Eternal life brings a life of just fullness and total contentment because we realize that it's not about this earth, but it's about living for Christ and having full purpose by living for his glory. So Jesus Christ has brought us new life and real life. The final verse for tonight is John 4, 14. John 4, 14. And it says, But the water I give them takes away thirst altogether. It becomes a perpetual spring within them, giving them eternal life. This overflowing, this perpetual spring that never runs dry is what Christ has come to bring us. So, when you come to that point of feeling worn down, of feeling broken, of feeling stuck, of feeling like you're totally on E, come to Christ who brings complete fullness. He is the only answer to the thirst that we have. 
Let me finish with a quote from Max Lucado, and he says, drink with me from this bottomless well. You don't have to live with a dehydrated heart. Receive Christ's work on the cross, the energy of his spirit, his lordship over your life, his unending, unfailing love. Drink deeply and drink often, and out of you will flow rivers of living water. Out of us, God's creation will then flow rivers of living water, and people around us will see the glory of God working through us, and they will be drawn to Christ through our lives. That's our purpose, is to bring glory to God and to bring others to himself. And once we come out of this place of emptiness and into this place of fullness, others will see the power of Christ working in our lives. And that's where we want to be. We don't want to be believers who are just going through the motions, who aren't a testimony of the power of Christ in their lives, but we want to be a walking testimony of God's fullness and power and satisfaction in our lives. So, the hope of this study is to displace the emptiness of the world within us, within us and to fill ourselves with the living waters of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, I thank you so much for this time, Lord. I thank you for all of those who are here tonight, God. I pray, Lord, that every one of us will truly come to realize that you bring fullness, that we don't have to stay empty, that you will come and recharge us completely, God. And Lord, we need you. And I pray that every one of us realizes our deep, desperate need for you and I pray that we will come to seek after you on a daily basis that we will truly yearn for you in every way and that we won't fall into the lies of this world and we won't seek after being filled by the things of this world but that we will find full satisfaction in you God we love you and we praise you and Lord I pray that as we go out that we will live for you fully and that others will see you working through us. It's in your glorious name that we pray. Amen. Amen.